This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. December 12, 1985. A chartered plane went down in flames outside Gander, Newfoundland, Canada, killing 248 American soldiers. Officially, the crash was ruled an accident caused by ice on the wings, but eyewitnesses tell of intense fires that could not be extinguished and a mysterious cache of weapons recovered from the wreckage. Could the young GIs have fallen victim to a terrorist bomb? As a child, Peggy Lloyd was haunted by the elusive vision of a brother she barely remembered. Finally, the discovery of an old snapshot launched Peggy on a determined quest for answers. Perhaps you can help end her search for her long-lost brother. The terrible tragedy in Waco, Texas has focused the nation's attention on the scattering of religious cults across the United States. In one cult, unrelated to the Branch Davidian sect, Nelson DeCloud was seen as a dynamic, charismatic messenger of God by his followers. However, according to one member who fled the cult, DeCloud used his position to demand sexual favors from some of the women in his congregation. Also tonight, a moving and joyous update. Thanks to our broadcast, two childhood friends separated for more than 30 years have been reunited. Join me for these fascinating stories of tonight's Unsolved Mysteries. These men were members of the elite 101st Airborne Unit of the United States Army. On December 12, 1985, they were among 248 young soldiers cut down in their prime. All killed instantly when their transport plane crashed at Gander, Newfoundland. It was the worst single air disaster in U.S. military history. Officially, the crash was written off to ice on the plane's wings. But many of the young men's families, as well as several key investigators, believe that the true cause of the Gander tragedy remains an unsolved mystery. On December 11, 1985, the 101st Airborne left Cairo, Egypt on a chartered Aeroair DC-8, much like this one. They were going home to Fort Campbell, Kentucky after a six-month peacekeeping mission in the Sinai. Following one stop in Germany, they landed for refueling at the Gander Newfoundland Airport in Canada. An hour later, just after takeoff, tragedy struck. The DC-8 crashed less than three miles from the Gander control tower, killing everyone on board. The wreckage was scattered over an area 1,300 feet long and 130 feet wide. Almost immediately, a man purporting to represent the terrorist organization, Islamic Jihad, telephoned a U.S. consulate in Algeria to claim responsibility. Nevertheless, U.S. Army officials, who arrived in Gander within hours, quickly discounted the possibility of terrorist involvement. Later, a Canadian Board of Inquiry stated that ice on the plane's wings had brought it down. However, four of the board's nine members publicly dissented, insisting that ICE did not cause the crash. There was certainly some kind of an explosion, and a small explosion that disabled the control system that, that led to the sequence of events that uh, led to dis disaster. But what caused that ex explosion, whether it was sabotage or whether it was the accidental detonation of some kind of military equipment that was carried uh, against regulations, 
we really don't have a better idea than we had in 1988. The dissenters were particularly disturbed by the pulverized state of the wreckage. Usually in a takeoff crash, large sections of the plane remain intact, and many passengers survive. A normal kind of takeoff accident can be quite serious and can involve a fire, but basically the aircraft isn't completely destroyed. You usually don't have a huge explosion because when the tanks are full, it doesn't give the fuel a chance to mix with oxygen like you need for an explosion. You get an explosion when the aircraft crashes with partial tanks, and uh, takeoff accidents are usually survivable. The U.S. government claimed there was no evidence that an onboard explosion had caused the crash. They steadfastly denied that either explosives or ammunition had been carried as cargo. Eyewitness reports from the Cairo airport, however, cast doubt on the government's position. The 101st Airborne waited for eight hours while they were transferred to a larger plane. In the process, the duffel bags of 41 soldiers were left behind on the tarmac to make room for several large wooden boxes. Many believe the boxes contained some type of classified weapons. At the Gander crash site, one of the rescue workers, Harvey Day, says he saw five wooden boxes. Sir, that's as far as you can go. I decided to walk down to see what was in this area. Well, I got about 10 feet from it, and this military guy walked up towards me and said, you better go back, so you're not allowed down there. But I stopped and looked, and I saw what people are beginning to say didn't exist. I saw five large wooden boxes. They were black, a bit burnt from the fire, and I saw harms, rifles, and I saw things like missiles and little metal boxes. They looked like ammunition boxes. And it was all piled up very neatly into this cordon off area. Sir, I can't answer that. This is military business. You do not need to know any of that at all. You no, 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 I just back. want to see what's Sir, in Sir, you don't have to see anything. This is official military business. If you don't leave, I'll have you removed by force from the premises. Now all just right. go on. All right. In addition, Day recalls one unusual hot spot resulting from the crash. There were two firefighters, and they had a continuous stream of water onto this pile. And uh, I thought it very peculiar, and I walked over to one chap, and I asked... What's going on, eh? Keep flaring up. We're going to have to keep pouring water on it. It's that bad? And the minute you took the water away, it just flared back up again. Oh, and he said, we've got to do this, he said until he said it burns out, he said it cools down to the, to the point we can remove what's there. Within weeks, Harvey Day and several other rescue workers began to complain of health problems. To some, the symptoms sounded suspiciously like radiation poisoning. I think we had over 30 who described some type of malady or sickness as a result of the crash. And uh, they ranged from liver problems to uh, what people thought were heart attacks and just general illnesses, and this, this is what was checked out, and uh, it, it got to be rather scary. According to one unnamed source, the United States government allegedly sealed its crash investigation records for a period of 70 years. However, several government agencies, including the Department of Defense and the National Transportation Safety Board, deny that any such records exist. We know that this, the files on the Gander incident would not be sealed for 70 years if it were simply ice. We know that there had to be something very, very politically embarrassing that could have been very harmful to the Reagan administration that had to be covered up. As one family member put it, she wants to know if her family member died protecting this country or if he died because our government was protecting itself. In the early 1980s, the United States government had begun illegally selling arms to Iran in a covert and Byzantine operation now known as Iran-Contra. The, the operation, ostensibly aimed at freeing American hostages in the Middle East, was apparently in jeopardy at the time of the Gander crash. The Security Council. I assumed that the president was Just a few days before the crash, Colonel Oliver North warned in at least two separate memos that the United States risked, quote, a renewed wave of terrorism. 
A U.S. reversal now could ignite Iranian fire. The hostages would be our minimum losses. Whatever happened in Gander, I believe, would have either caused um, political embarrassment or an international incident or both. And whatever the reason was for the cover-up in 1985 still exists today. U.S. government investigators did appear to be behaving strangely. First off, the crash site was bulldozed within three months, a highly unusual practice. The U.S. Army says it was done simply to discourage souvenir hunters. Secondly, the remains of the plane were quickly disposed of, buried in a dump. Again, highly unusual procedure. As a rule, downed airplanes are virtually reassembled in order to study the crash. One of the young men who lost his life at Gander was 23-year-old Sergeant James Douglas Phillips, the only son of Dr. Douglas Phillips, a pathologist. Disillusioned by the official reports, Dr. Phillips and his wife Zona formed an organization called Families for Truth About Gander. They requested several scrap sections from the DC-8 and were surprised when the government sent them. An expert hired to analyze the scraps claimed the outward puckered edges showed that a blast had indeed occurred inside the plane. I think the airplane exploded in midair and then went down and it hit the ground with a gigantic fireball ensuing upon hitting when the fuel ignited. But there's no doubt in my mind that there was a fire or an explosion while the plane was still in flight. Dr. Phillips turned up one final chilling fact. Autopsies revealed that many of the dead soldiers had a significant amount of carbon monoxide in their bodies. The toxicology report showed that the victims had indeed breathed in carbon monoxide prior to the plane hitting the ground and exploding. This had to be from a detonation, a fire or explosion on board the craft. I guess the thing that bothers me the most is there are people out there living ordinarily, uh, ordinary uh, day life, going about their business and their jobs, and they know what happened. And they won't tell us, and they won't help us. In 1990, a congressional hearing on the Gander disaster was convened in Washington, D.C. While the committee did criticize the government's lackluster post-crash investigation, it stopped short of recommending a full-scale reinvestigation. The families of the dead men are left to wonder why and how their sons, husbands, and brothers really died. Next, a woman discovers that her long-lost father was a circus clown with a broken heart. During the Second World War, more than 16 million American men and women were called upon to serve the country. Inevitably, many families would not survive the stress of wartime separation. 28-year-old Lee Curley Lloyd was one of those whose marriage was a casualty of the war effort. While Curley was in the service, his son and two daughters lived in Oroville, California, with a woman who ran a boarding house for children. At the, door. at the time, Peggy Lloyd was three years old, her sister four, and their little brother Arthur two. One day in 1944, Curly's wife arrived at the boarding house. She was accompanied by the man she would marry when her divorce was final. Um, I've, I've come here, I want to take my children. Just the girls, though, not Arthur. Okay. Peggy and her sister went to live with their mother and the man who was to become their stepfather. It's all right, okay, let's go. Peggy's brother, Arthur, was left behind. Peggy Lloyd grew up being told that her father had deserted the family and questions about her brother were ignored or brushed aside. She began to wonder if Arthur had ever even existed until a quiet summer day in 1948. I 
I climbed up into the attic and crawled along, kind of looking at things. And in the back was a bunch of boxes. So I was playing in this particular group of boxes, and I found this picture. When I looked at the picture, I just, I knew that it was Arthur. And I, wouldn't, I couldn't say that that was a memory, it was a feeling. It was like, he looked like me, he was the right age, it just felt, I knew that it was Arthur. Look, it's Arthur, my brother. Then that proves it. He's my brother. She took the picture from me, and it went away. And I never saw the picture again, and I still never got an answer. But of course, in my mind, I just knew. And so I guess that I just grew up believing that wherever my father was, Arthur was. Peggy's life at home grew increasingly difficult. At the age of nine, she was sent to the first in a series of foster homes and boarding schools. She married in 1958 at age 17 and raised four daughters of her own. Over the years, Peggy remained in contact with her mother, but never learned anything more about her brother or father. I've been working on it for a whole year. Finally, in 1983, Peggy presented her mother with a picture-filled genealogical chart as a way of once again bringing up the subject of Arthur and Curly. The first one starts with 1879. Oh, my. Look way up here. Oh, look at me. I was an adult now, and she didn't have to be so afraid of what I did. And perhaps she would give me that information and feel like enough time had passed that she could do that. I forgot forgotten that one. <laughs> but you know, Mom, there is still something missing. I still don't have any information about my own father. Peggy, don't start with me again, please. We just want to know where he was born, Mom. In the end, Peggy's mother relented and reluctantly revealed Curly's birthplace. Please, Mom. Lindsay, Oklahoma. Thanks. Thanks. The next day, I called there on the phone, and I put an ad in their local weekly newspaper asking if anybody knew his whereabouts or Arthur's. And it was from there that things began to happen. The family secrets of nearly 40 years were unlocked with stunning speed. Just nine days after placing the ad, Peggy received a letter from an aunt, Velma Lloyd, who was married to Curly's brother. Velma had included her phone number, and Peggy immediately called her newly discovered relative. Hello? May I speak with Velma Lloyd, please? Hi, Velma. While I was talking to her on the phone, I was like flipping through the rest of the letters. And there I saw this one that had one of those return address stamps on it that said Curly and Q, Clown Alley, Spokane. When I fought, saw the letter from my dad, it was like, I felt like my heart stopped. It was a mixture. It's like I was really excited and really emotional. I started crying, but I was really frightened. I didn't know anything about my father. I thought, well, what if what he says in the letter is I don't want anything to do with you? But of, of course, I just overcame that. And, and I opened the letter, and the letter said, my beloved daughter, how thrilled I am to hear from you. It was like, um, it's indescribable. Peggy was surprised to learn that for many years, both before and after the war, her father was a clown with Ringling Brothers and other smaller circuses. In 1955, Curly had even performed within five miles of Peggy's home in Southern California. But they would not see each other until Peggy's 43rd birthday in 1984. This home video was shot at Peggy and Curly's long-awaited reunion in Spokane, Washington. It was the first birthday Peggy had spent with her father since she was three years old. Now 
Suddenly I had a grandfather and aunts and uncles and cousins and just this whole world of family. And they just all acted like I'd been there my whole life, like they'd always been my family. And it's just a wonderful thing. The celebration was perfect in every way but one. Peggy's brother, Arthur, was not with the family. But finally, Peggy was able to learn what had happened to Arthur since she last saw him in 1944. For four years, Arthur had traveled with a circus, watching his father perform in towns and cities across America. Curly had no idea where his ex-wife and his two daughters were living. Hey, Prissy Monkey, you were real good in the show today. Hi, Prissy Monkey. At first, Curly believed that circus life would be rewarding for his young son. Curly himself had joined the circus when he was nine and saw nothing wrong with their itinerant life. His friends advised him otherwise. The circus people told him that Arthur needed to be in school. Arthur needed a home, stability, real parents and a family that he could grow up with in one place and that the circus life wasn't a good home for him. Curly, have you thought this out carefully? Yes, I have. After much soul searching, Curly reached a painful decision. He sought out a Catholic priest in Logan, Utah, where the circus was yeah. performing in the fall of 1948. All right. Church can find him a home. I appreciate Curly. it. Take care of yourself, okay? Thank you, Father. Say goodbye to your son. Arthur? Hey, come here. Listen. Hey, I want you to take care of yourself, okay? All right? And um, this man here, he's going to take care of you. Be good and remember everything Daddy told you, okay? All right? Okay, you run along now. Arthur was six years old when Curly gave him up for adoption. Fifteen years later, Curly would receive two letters from his son, but neither contained Arthur's adoptive last name or his return address. The letters had been mailed from Colorado Springs, Colorado. I tried Colorado Springs. I didn't find anything there. I seemed to be at a loss. And when my dad became really ill, it was like, I have to find Arthur. I have to find him before he dies. Hi. Hi, look at you. You're just a mess. Just a mess. How you doing, huh? Curly and I had seven really wonderful years of friendship. Peggy. Peggy, I... We became really good friends, and we talked about Arthur a lot. He really felt really sad about it, and he felt really guilty about it. I've only got one regret. That we, that we haven't found Arthur. I, I, I want you to find him. I will find him. Tell him I'm, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It was like he said to me, Peggy, I don't know about Arthur. I'm so sorry about Arthur but I know that you'll find him. Somehow I believe that, I know that we will. Lee Curley Lloyd died in 1991 at the age of 77. He was comforted at least in some measure by Peggy's promise to continue searching for Arthur. This is one of only two known photographs of Arthur Franklin Lloyd. When the picture was taken, Arthur was two years old and had blonde hair. He has blue eyes and would today be 50 years old. I have to find Arthur. I have to find him to say you have a family. You have someone, not just myself, but all of Curly's family who love you and want you and we want to know you. When we return, 
A young woman accuses a spiritual leader of rape. Authorities need your help to find him. Shortly before midnight on September 17, 1992, a young woman named Julie Cooper made an impassioned phone call, a cry for help to Tim Santee, a virtual stranger whom she had met only once okay? when he repaired the satellite dish on the farm where she lived. When can you come pick me up? Julie had told me bits and pieces of what had gone on, but I'm still not aware of the whole story. And I'm thinking, well, you know, it's no big deal. Nobody's going to catch us. We tentatively set the time for 1.15 in the morning. I drove up to the corner um, before you get to the road down to her house at 1.13. I waited for two minutes and drove down there. She was crouched down in the grass um, with a trash bag full of clothes. Go, go, go! She was very, very nervous and very afraid. Family, you are the wearers of white. Julie Cooper told Tim Sandy that for 16 years she had been trapped in a religious cult called the DeCloud family. The family, nearly 30 men, women, and children, lived together in a commune far removed from the outside world. In some ways, the DeCloud family resembled the Branch Davidian sect, the religious cult led by David Koresh in Waco, Texas. That group lived in a fortified compound where a two-month standoff with federal agents recently ended in tragedy. David Koresh's group was just one of an estimated 2,000 religious cults which have sprung up throughout the country. Many are headed by self-proclaimed messiahs who rule with absolute authority. When Julie Cooper finally escaped from the DeCloud family, she began to make accusations which paint a horrifying picture of life within the commune. The most chilling allegations focus on the leader of the cult, Nelson DeCloud. Nelson DeCloud is an ex-police officer from Raytown, Missouri, a suburb of Kansas City. His family, as he calls his followers, had actually been founded by his father, Forrest DeCloud, around 1968. Before Forrest died in 1988, Nelson ascended to the role of spiritual leader. Soon he moved his followers to an isolated farm in Liberty, Missouri. Nearly all family members were encouraged to change their last names to DeCloud, literally of the clouds. Quiet, please. Praise the Lord and welcome him into the temple to cloud. Praise the Lord. 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 Today's lesson is from Revelations 13. Open your Bibles, please. Nelson thought that he was um, God's son. Not really that he was Jesus Christ, but that he was uh, one of God's sons and that he couldn't do any wrong. And I said unto him, Sir. Nelson had a very booming voice. And his eyes were me, like these are they which came a white blue where they just and have would scare you. robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Praise the Lord. Julie Cooper was just six when her family joined the cult in the mid-70s. We are the Julie claims she eventually the learned that the cloud expected we perverse, almost repulsive forms of devotion of from his followers. Hallelujah. When she was 10, Julie says the cloud forced her to watch him have sex with a female member of the family. To me. Amen. Amen. I want you to stay out here for a little while. He asked me to have sex with him, and I didn't want to, and I didn't. What I want you to do, Julie, is what God wants you to do. You understand me? Yes. All right. I guess he was so far into he couldn't do any wrong kind of deal that it didn't matter to him. Now, you listen to me. Do you know how old Mary was when she had Jesus? 14 years old, 14 years old. Now, you think about that. There's nothing wrong with that. He put me out in this, like, wooded area. I didn't have any food. I didn't have any jacket or anything like that. When are you coming back? 
I'll know when to come back. God will tell me when to come back. <laughs> According to Julie, she stood in the field, alone and shivering, for eight hours before Nelson took her back to the compound. Disobedience. There is a sinner amongst us. And I am deeply troubled. Julie says that another member of the family was publicly humiliated the after she confronted the cloud about his cruelty. She has chosen to disobey my word. She has chosen to disobey God's word. Well, he was going to make an example of her in front of me and in front of others. Comes penance! And that was enough to scare me. He knew that I was already scared. To ourselves no! or husbands. I felt like it was my fault because here she tried to stand up for me and I wasn't giving in. And maybe if I had given in earlier, he wouldn't have done that. He found me, you know, and he says, well, are you ready now? And of course, you know, after all that had happened, and I just said, yes. Julie Cooper claims she became a virtual prisoner in the compound, forced to serve as one of the Cloud's unwilling sex partners. When she was 15, Julie says she made her first attempt to escape. After everything had happened to me, everything was going on, um, I decided to run away. You know, I just couldn't take any more. Julie's absence did not go unnoticed. Nelson the Cloud immediately organized search parties to comb the area. Stop right where you are. You hear me, girl? You stay right there. Stop right there. Come here. Come here. Don't let me go, please! <laughs> let me go! Nelson and another guy came, picked me up, handcuffed me, and took me back. I was so scared of him, of what would happen to me. Offer your shoes! According to Julie, she was ordered to disrobe, and later she was severely beaten. Off of your shirt. Nelson um, switched me and uh, burned my clothes, burned my shoes, and it was like a symbolic thing. After that, he always kept me with him. I always had to sleep with him in his, in his bus, in his area. He wouldn't let me out of anybody's sight. I always had to be watched, so. That's one thing that really kept me on edge, you know, and kept me from ever trying to run away because I was afraid someone would see me. Seven more years passed. Julie Cooper remained, feeling stripped of her freedom and dignity, waiting for one more chance to escape. Then in the fall of 1992, the opportunity arose. At Nelson's request, Julie contacted a satellite dish repairman. Numerous calls followed until finally Tim Santee made his appearance at the DeCloud commune. As I pull into the driveway, I see several cars. I see um, a lot of kids running around, and the first impression that I get is that, you know, this has to be some type of party. Right, yeah, okay. Sister Julie, could I interrupt you just a second? This is Tim. He's the uh, man from the satellite company. Yeah. When I got into the office, I guess I sort of more or less recognized Julie's because I had built up a rapport with her on the telephone uh, in the weeks preceding to me coming up there and doing uh, the service call. Okay. Um, down here's her unit. Yeah, yeah right here. Mm -hmm. here. Julie was very meek in as much as she wasn't um, as outgoing as she was on the phone, that she seemed stifled or um, held back because of some some other reason than than anything obvious. Ah, <sighs> yeah. oh, Brother Nelson, this is our brother in God, Nelson DeCloud. Nelson, I'd like for you to meet Tim. When Tim was introduced to Nelson, he didn't show him any respect. He didn't think of him as anybody or anything. And that made me feel good. It made me feel like I could trust in someone. I could actually talk to this person and he could understand me. Over the next couple of weeks afterward, 
Um, I had asked her out for a date, and she had seemed like she was willing, but was not, that there was something that was holding her back. Well, he had asked me out, and of course I told him that I couldn't go, and I couldn't go for a year, you know, wouldn't be able to get out for a year. And that was just the way of putting him off and seeing if he was willing to go on with trying to wear me down. In the course of our conversations on the phone, um, we had, she had come up with a plan that she had, that she would need to sneak out at night undetected. I called him up and I said, I want to go tonight. Well, we made a time at 1.15 in the morning, and uh, sure enough, 1.15 hit, he was there. Go, go, go! After I left, um, I was afraid they would take me back. Um, they would beat me, uh, do something to my mom. I'm still afraid that he is torturing my mom in some way for what I've done. At dawn, Nelson DeCloud went looking for Julie, allegedly masquerading as police officers. Nelson and another family member drove to Tim Santy's address. Hey, hey, where's Julie? What? Where is Julie? Who's Julie? Fortunately for Julie, the address belonged to Tim's brother, Ted. Tim and Julie were just a few yards away, sound asleep in the house next door. Where are you guys? We're, we're looking for the, for the police, looking for Tim. You got a warrant or something? We're you got a warrant, pal? We're, we're looking for Tim. Tim. Where, where is Tim? You guys are Hey! We, we get the hell out of here! here. All right, Tim. You both get the hell The next day, Ted came up to me and said, what the hell's going on here? Two strange people had come into his home, um, looking for me like I, you know, like I was a criminal or something. They won't let me leave. And that's when they, Julie had told us the whole thing of what was going on. Why did you want to run away? She had also alluded to the fear that yes. any man that was physically able from that yes. group would probably they come in and try me. to get her. And they raped me, and I can't stay there anymore. How, well, how long has this been going That's on? when we decided to put restraining orders against anyone who was physically able to abduct her. So you want to go back? I never want to go back, ever. All right. All when you first get out, you feel kind of, you don't know what you are to do, or, you know, how to stop things. And that was just the first step for me, just to keep them away. Because I knew they had brought people back before that had gone away and beat them and stuff. and I was afraid something like that would happen to me. Last Thursday, I called my friend Tim to come pick me up. Detective Dwayne Wiersma of the Clay County Sheriff's Department had long been suspicious about because the cult. I to leave. What happened? When he brought Julie Cooper in for questioning, she provided a detailed and harrowing account of her entire childhood. I was abused. I believed Julie from the beginning. Abuse, what, what type of abuse? We uh, had a hard time trying just to focus on the charges that, of rape at the time, because there were so many other things that could have been, he could have been charged with. Before an arrest warrant could be issued, Nelson DeCloud ordered the women and children to load their possessions onto four converted buses. Nelson then took them away from the commune. The other men departed a week later. The Cloud family has not been seen since. It's not an everyday occurrence where you come upon a religious group led by such a powerful individual as Nelson De Cloud. You're asking for me in the next couple of days. We believe they're still together because uh, Nelson feeds off the power of being in control of a group. If he doesn't have the group, then he has no power. I want Nelson to get caught because it's not fair to anyone else that's up there. Um, my mom and dad, they, they need to know that he isn't the Messiah. He can't do things on his own and think that he can get away with it. He's not above that. He's a criminal. What he was doing was wrong. After our broadcast, several viewers from San Angelo, Texas, a small town 500 miles from DeCloud's old headquarters in Missouri, called to say they had seen DeCloud's wife in the area. 
The cult had apparently settled in this farmhouse. When state and local agents converged on the scene, the cloud kicked off the screen of the upstairs window in an attempt to escape. And the deputies approached him, and he tried to wrestle with a few of them briefly. There were so many law enforcement officers, though, that he didn't, that didn't last very long. They uh, put the handcuffs on him and um, escorted him out of the building. Nelson DeCloud was booked at the local county jail and later extradited to Liberty, Missouri to stand trial on four criminal counts, including forcible rape and sodomy. Since the arrest of Nelson DeCloud, other former members of the group have come forward wanting to testify about things they witnessed when they were members of the group. Nelson DeCloud is currently out on bail thanks to $25,000 raised by followers. A trial is scheduled for November 16, 1993. If convicted on all charges, Nelson DeCloud could spend the rest of his life in prison. I feel confident now that I can have a normal life after seeing him caught, knowing that it can be done. For Julie Cooper, her long ordeal is almost, but not quite over. She still has to testify to Cloud's upcoming trial. However, this courageous young woman has already found a happy ending to her story. Last summer, Julie became engaged to Tim Santee, the man who helped her escape. <laughs> Next, a dramatic reunion. A woman finds her long-lost best friend who helped her overcome the trauma of polio. Recently, we featured the moving story of Judy Davis, who was stricken with polio as a young girl. Judy was searching for her best childhood friend, Becky Terry. The two girls had been wrenched apart back in 1958 when Becky's family moved away. Judy and Becky had met on their first day of junior high. To the other students, Judy, with her braces and crutches, was an unnerving sight, and she was often the object of curious stares. But one girl was different. One girl offered Judy the precious gift of unconditional friendship. Can I help? Thanks. Well, what home are you in? The letter said 102. That's <laughs> the same one I'm in. It's this Becky's job. friendship to me meant that I was able to be accepted by the other students in the school. And it made me feel like I was more like everyone else and that there was no difference between us. And at the age of 12, that meant a lot. And it still means a lot. During our special live broadcast last winter, Judy waited anxiously at her home in Tucson, Arizona, hoping that Becky would be found. To everyone's joy, they were reunited by phone while the program was still on the air. Oh, I'm so glad I found you. <laughs> Three months later, Becky and her husband flew from their home in West Virginia to meet Judy in Tucson. If he hadn't stopped, I'd have jumped out anyway. <laughs> I seen her sitting in that yard and I couldn't wait to see her. <laughs> oh gosh. Finding Becky and telling her what all, what she meant to me was really important. And I didn't want life to end without being able to tell her that. She hasn't changed that much. Maybe we're a little fatter, you know, but we love each other. <laughs> we'll say good friends. Yeah. That's the one thing I always loved about Becky. She accepted me for the way I was, and I still feel that way. Happily, Judy and Becky's reunion had an unexpected postscript. As girls in junior high school, they shared a very special friend. His name was David Major. David had first been Becky's boyfriend, and later on, Judy's. During our live broadcast, David contacted our telecenter and left his phone number. On the day of their reunion, Judy and Becky just had to call him back. I'll bet you never guess who this is. Uh, no. Judy Davis. 
Judy tell my guts. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> How are you? I'm just fine. Becky and I are sitting here having our reunion for the... Is that right? Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's great to hear your voice. Oh. Me now. <laughs> oh really? Oh really? God. You you've changed a little? Oh yeah, I'm not skinny anymore. Oh you're not? No, God. Well no. that's all right, honey. Neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this. It's the two girls that taught me how to kiss. But <laughs> oh, darn. Yeah. Oh, that's now the circle was at last complete. So the two girls who taught David Major how to kiss took their husbands out to celebrate the renewal of a very special friendship. I'd like to propose a toast to old friends. And new ones. And new ones, yeah, yeah. and new ones. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, and please join us next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs>